Is it time we learn to live with the coronavirus? And how should we all prepare for a new wave of infections? Some countries reimpose lockdowns while others prioritize their economies. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. Lockdowns to stop the spread of coronavirus are being lifted worldwide. Shops and businesses are reopening. Students are returning to school. And some airlines are flying again. But several countries have since reported a resurgence in new infections. Iran relaxed its lockdown in April when the worst COVID-19 outbreak in the Middle East began to ease. But this week, the president threatened to reimpose restrictions as doctors recorded the highest ever total of daily cases. South Korea was praised for controlling its outbreak, but shortly after they reopened, hundreds of schools, museums and parks are closed again because of a new wave of infections in the capital Seoul. China, Germany, Japan and Saudi Arabia all reimposed some restrictions over the past month. Some scientists say a second wave of infections is inevitable. The World Health Organization warned recently that we may all have to learn to live with the virus. This virus may become just another endemic virus in our communities, and this virus may never go away. HIV has not gone away, but we've come to terms with the virus, and we have found the therapies, and we've found the prevention methods, and people don't feel as scared uh, uh, as they did before, and we're offering life to people with HIV, long, healthy lives to people with HIV. Let's introduce the panel. In Manchester, in the US state of Connecticut, Jeff Schlegelmilch, Deputy Director of the National Centre for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Here in Doha, Dr Ali Omrani, Head of Research at the Communicable Diseases Centre at Hamad Medical Corporation. And in Oxford, England, Jan Emmanuel Deneve, Behavioural Economist and Director of the Wellbeing Research Centre at Oxford University. Welcome to you all. Uh, Dr Omrani, I'll begin with you first of all, because are we right to assume that there will be a second wave of the coronavirus and maybe a third, a fourth and a fifth? Uh, well, hello, Bernard. Um, well, unfortunately, we're almost certain there will be uh, learning from previous experiences with viruses that affect the respiratory tract generally, and the behavior of uh, coronavirus is not expected to be any different. Uh, once you've got the initial measures um, containing the initial outbreak, there will be inevitably further waves. Um, th the size and the extent of those waves is where we could perhaps do something to, to limit and minimize uh, the effect of OK. And Jan Emanuel, then, if, if we're going to experience further waves, how do you keep your populations with you, fatigued as they are, having endured a first wave? Uh, a lot of fatigue, indeed, and we see it uh, in the compliance behaviours with the current lockdown uh, really uh, dropping um, quite a bit. And even now, post-lockdown, people, obviously, um, we see uh, decreasing rates of, of compliance. However... Um, when, um, if in the case of a second wave, we see uh, the uh, contagion rate go up again and fear taking hold in society, then there is demand from people to um, impose uh, strong, robust measures to provide psychological stability and a certain sense of security. So when the first uh, big wave hit, there was uh, a general and universal approval uh, for these lockdown measures and people held by them. So my sense is, although we have a lot of fatigue now, if there are big waves coming across to uh, or towards us and fear takes hold and lots of anxiety, then people will be willing to accept, I think, new measures to keep them safe. Jeff, how do you keep populations with you as you try and manage the next wave of coronavirus? So it, it's kind of a moving target depending on different dynamics within the population. But I think one of the largest things is really to create this shared identity that we're all in this together and to avoid 
these traps of fracturing the population or trying to blame other political parties or other segments of the society. Um, and certainly, you know, fear can be a motivator. It can also make someone very, very defensive, depending on whether or not they feel there's any control, anything that they can do about it. So I think really reaching out not only from the government institutions to create a sense of unity, but also into these other leadership roles within the community, within the faith-based community, within various social circles is really going to be critical to, to sustain into the, the medium term uh, this notion of we're all in it together and the importance of these measures to protect not only ourselves, but also our families and our loved ones. OK, so, Dr Omrani, can we say how effective quarantine measures have been in slowing down the spread of the virus so far? Can people be persuaded that it's been worth it? I think most people would say yes. Um, there will be, obviously, some will argue against this, but the facts on the ground say that until those lockdown measures and quarantine and social and physical distancing measures were introduced uh, in effective, uh, uh, to effective extent, until these things became reality, um, the outbreak wasn't really under control in any way. Uh, and there are many um, population level examples that one can point at. Uh, China is, is the obvious one, but there are also now recent experiences from Europe. Uh, Italy is now starting to get back to normal. This would have been impossible without the social and physical distancing interventions that had the government had to impose and the population at large uh, complied with and, and worked with. So I think it, it works uh, and the evidence say it does. Quantification is not easy, but the modeling shows clearly that without them, this would have gone on and on and on, unabated, um, sadly with far more people affected and inevitably more people needing hospital care and eventually some or a large proportion would, would die. Um, so uh, I think they are important, and I think um, a certain level of restriction may well be back uh, with further waves. And I think this may be a motivator for many societies um, to not want to be back where we were. And perhaps if do, new waves do come in, as your guests were saying, I suspect that a significant proportion of the society would just want to do exactly the right things as early as they're told they need to be doing those. So, Yanni Manuel, you think people will be prepared to go through all this again. I mean, there are societies where, of course, you know, Brazil, 25,000 new cases a day they're having there. But in Europe, you think they'll go through this again? Well, again, if the situation is, is of such kind that uh, fear takes hold and there's lots of anxiety, then people are demanding for strong measures. But I do want to come back on one thing. We did learn quite a few things through this first lockdown. Um, and I do think we may be all in this together but a, I hope that we will have more targeted or segmented policy going into a potential second lockdown. Um, we need to do much more to protect the elderly and those with low immunity. Because um, as we know, in fact, just Belgium this morning released its numbers on uh, the, the fact that two thirds of, of COVID related deaths were actually people in elderly care homes. And you'll see this replicated around the world. So much more needs to be done on that front. And on the economic and social psychological consequences, uh, predominantly fall on the shoulders of younger generations or young parents or, 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 or school-going children. So more needs to be done to support them also. So I think there's um, we do need, and I see uh, um, our own modeling and that of my colleagues at MIT, it's pretty clear uh, that we do need to be more tailor-made in policy rather than a one-size-fits-all. Jeff, what have you learned of, uh, of how people have responded in the States, a very fragmented approach to dealing with the coronavirus there, of course? Yeah, and, and of course, that's putting it uh, quite politely, a very fragmented approach. And, and I think the reality is, is that certainly among the epidemiologists in the scientific community, it's very, very clear that the various uh, social restrictions, social uh, distancing, physical distancing, um, quasi lockdowns, et cetera, have been extraordinarily effective in depressing the spread of the virus. That being said, to many, many individuals, they are experiencing, at least from their own perception, more pain from the economic slowdown, from the loss of job, from the loss of movement than they are uh, if perhaps they're not seeing the consequences of this around them. And I think that that's a really, really important dynamic. And when we talk about additional waves of this virus and even the potential for a resurgence, as we're seeing in some parts of the United States, of states that have opened prematurely of uh, certain you know, uh, kinds of interactions that are, uh, have a lot of potential to, to spread this virus um, uh, simply with the lifting of these social and physical distancing measures. So it'll be really, really important for policymakers uh, in the United States as well as globally to really look at the disproportionate impact of these control measures. 
who is experiencing outsized pain as a result of not being able to leave, not being able to go to work, because addressing that is going to be critically important in maintaining momentum and maintaining the buy-in as these social distancing measures need to be implemented and, and withdrawn and re-implemented and withdrawn as, as we kind of go through this dance until there's a more viable vaccine or pharmaceutical strategy to uh, stopping the pandemic. Uh, and Dr. Ali Amrani, is that something you, we look at in this part of the world, in the Middle East, when you're looking at the effect of the virus on different types of population? Of course, here there are people who rely on, it de uh, rely on working day to day to, to eat. They can't be locked down for long periods of time, can they? Uh, th that is uh, absolutely true. Uh, in this specific part of the world, um, in the Middle East and in the Gulf region, uh, there are many people who would necessarily fall into this category. The vast majority of people um, who are on the lower end of the income are employed and would um, have continued to earn some income during those difficult periods. Uh, perhaps worst affected was um, smaller businesses who were unable to operate um, their, uh, their normal hours, uh, and they may have felt most of the economic pain, uh, but not necessarily at the very lower end of the economic spectrum. Um, Society, as I see it here in the Gulf region from my day-to-day -day work and interactions with various friends and circles and contacts, I know that by far everyone has got to the point now where obviously people are to a large extent fed up and would quite like to go back to something resembling normality. However, they're also very mindful that doing this too quickly could backfire and they could find themselves back on square zero. So I think most people have accepted uh, a principle of a stage return to normality with a careful gauging of any uh, increased activity with always the knowledge that th the restrictions may be, back book in, may be put back in again uh, if needed. I think personally that the majority of the population have reached this understanding and are willing to play their part as long as they can see light in the end of the tunnel. I think this is very important. And again, some of the points made about targeting any return of restrictions. I think this is a, this was a, an experience for uh, most of us, and I don't think the authorities are any different. And I think that in future waves, there may well be adjustments to how restrictions would be applied and what sections of the society would need more protection than others, and various policies to protect uh, economic interests and ensure people's compliance in the long term. I think all these things will have to be looked at and hopefully modified as needed going forward. I mean, Yanni Annuel, Dr Omrani there mentioned the need to see light at the end of the tunnel. Might we be seeing that in Europe, though? It seems to be getting away with it. Italy, a month now since it started lifting lockdown restrictions, no major spikes. Um, might we be getting away with it? And is it habits that we've now formed that are helping us, uh, that is helping Europe to contain it? New habits, I mean. Yeah. Indeed, there's some light at the in, at the tunnel in the very near term. Um, we see borders within the European context opening up. Um, people are hoping to still have some season of tourism. So um, um, mid this month, uh, uh, Italy is already open on the 15th. Many other European nations open up. Spain opens up on the 1st of July for tourism. So there's some uh, short term optimism. But the bad news, however, is colleagues at Cambridge and Public Health England uh, this yesterday came out with the numbers, the, the reproduction rate, the famous R, the rate of contagion, if you will, is starting to creep back up over one in some parts of the country in England. Um, and so that is not an immediate concern, if you will, but if that continues, that will uh, depress, I think, that, 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 uh, that light at the end of the tunnel. The real light at the end of the tunnel, and, I, um, and I'm speaking here from Oxford, um, is um, our um, vaccine group um, is, um, is, uh, is making good progress uh, on these trials for a vaccine. And uh, in collaboration with AstraZeneca, who are now preparing the productive capacity to hopefully be able to produce millions of vaccine files by October. So you will have seen a lot of the, the senior folks in that group and in AstraZeneca coming out positively, and hopefully um, they are right. So I think the real light of the tunnel is that there may be that there's a number of vaccine uh, trials ongoing that are looking promising and that hopefully by October, towards the end of the year, miraculously almost, we will be able to um, very swiftly move towards that. So that will be the okay. actual light at the tunnel. But I think, as our colleagues have said on, on this interview, there are some uh, clearly some definite bumps along the road. And we should we should also not forget we may be talking here about the potential of a second lockdown. 
if you look at Brazil, India, and other places around the world, they're right in the midst of the first wave. Mm. So um, this is very much still, still a global pandemic going around the globe. All right. Jeff, have you noticed that behavioural changes that people have had to make in terms of washing their hands, wearing face masks, social distancing, is that sinking in? Is that helping control the spread and, is, and are people are remembering to do these things? Yes, uh, uh, as you mentioned previously, you know, it's a, it's a very uneven response throughout the United States. But in general, we do see, you know, the wearing of masks in a way that was socially just very, very unprecedented, as opposed to parts of Asia where it's more normative. You go into the grocery store now, uh, it's at least where I live in Connecticut, you're seeing most of the people, if not all of them, wearing masks, doing their best to keep some degree of social distancing um, and doing everything they can. Now, how long this persists and how long we can keep up this momentum, uh, is this something that's in ingrained more permanently? Are we going to see five years from now in cold and flu season more people wearing masks, things like that? That remains to be seen. But I think there have definitely been a number of social norms that have been changed for the most part, although uh, it is worth noting and important to note that there are also clusters within various states and within various uh, communities that are really outright refusing, pushing back very much, why should I have to wear a mask kind of things like that. Um, and it just shows that that while, uh, you know, we're making a lot of progress in terms of normalizing what we have to do until, uh, you know, we reach that light at the end of the tunnel some distance away, there's still a lot of folks who are uh, not buying into that, not feeling a part of that, who are feeling that they're sacrificing too much of their freedoms. And uh, it's very important that we remain um, sensitive to that and adjust our messaging and adjust our pr approaches to try to reach folks to make this as, as universal as possible for everyone's well-being. OK. Dr Ali, Ali Amrani, uh, a possible vaccine notwithstanding, how long are we going to have this period of, of maybe peaks and troughs in the coronavirus before it, uh, before it disappears or becomes something that we just uh, live with on a smaller scale? Well, I, I don't think anyone can really give you um, a certain answer to this question. Uh, without a game-changing uh, vaccine or vaccines, uh, this is likely to keep coming and going until the majority of the population on this earth uh, are immune. And, and that could take uh, years uh, if uh, we're interfering with uh, physical distancing and other interventions. Uh, if we let it run wild, then obviously this would um, run around and, and, and do its circle around the globe much quicker. We're obviously at a much, much heavier price in terms of uh, human health uh, and deaths and suffering and economy and so forth. So um, the current approach um, is not sustainable. Uh, we can't keep doing this forever. Uh, but if we don't come up with a game-changing vaccine, as I said, then this could go on for years and years. Uh, if I may also go back to the, to the point about the behavioral uh, changes, uh, if you would allow me. Uh, I, I think I, I agree entirely with your guest about uh, to what extent people would want to comply. But obviously, in some societies, including Southeast Asia and the Middle East, uh, the authorities have also taken some proactive steps to push public behavior in certain direction. So where I live, for example, wearing a mask is, is, is mandatory. It's required by law. I can't walk into a grocery store and not wear a mask. I can't walk into a grocery store and not use alcohol gel right at the entrance. I can't you walk into any store without showing my uh, mobile phone app that shows that I have not been tested positive, nor have I been suspected of being positive. So that then pushes my behavior, it pushes everyone's behavior towards complying with those restrictions and measures while they're there. And obviously, um, the extent uh, of acceptance and, and the extent of even uh, willingness or appetite for applying such interventions would vary quite naturally from one place to another. Uh, but in places where these things have been applied, uh, then behavior um, changes as well. Whether it would obviously uh, that behavior will continue should you take those mandatory um, uh, implementation uh, requirements uh, away is obviously an unknown question. If I could also just take a few seconds to add another point related to behavior, which is beyond what we're doing now for, for, for physical distancing. I, I really think we need to also have a good look back at the very origin of why are we have, having emerging viruses like these causing global pandemics. Okay. What, what human okay. habits need, need to change to try to prevent this in the future? Okay. And, uh, uh, Yanni Manuel, are we seeing 
evidence of how people have been affected by the lockdown. I'm ta talking psychologically in terms of anxiety and stress, because you say that people are prepared to obey the rules, but it's, having, it's taking a toll, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, today, for example, we are much lower in terms of well-being, measured as uh, life satisfaction or mental health concerns, as we were at the, at the point in time, in normal times, say January or, or same same period last year. However, the important point here is that the real drop in well-being and mental health actually came, so the, well, the drop in well-being and the increase in mental health concerns happened in that in-between period, the, the, week, the two weeks, to, in the case of the UK, the two weeks prior to the lockdown, so the first two weeks of March in the case of the UK. That's when we saw a massive, unprecedented drop in life satisfaction around, around uh, the UK. And the lockdown um, actually halted, mitigated the drop, and we've been slowly and gradually recovering ever since, adapting to the new normal, if you will. If you will. So the important note here, which I don't think people realize, is yes, we're at a lower level of well-being today than we are in normal times, but we've recovered already a big chunk of the original loss, which took place in that bizarre period in between the old normal and the new normal. And people have seemed to have forgotten, but th those weeks, end of February, early March, in the European context at least, there was widespread fear and anxiety. You may recall that we were hoarding toilet paper. Uh, and so right. luckily all of that has subsided. So it's that period where mental health, generally speaking, was most impacted. And the lockdown actually did, did well on that front it, and was well received. Uh, and that's what we pick up in the well-being statistics. OK, and Jeff, from where you are, are people more determined now to just try and push through and live with the virus or accept the restrictions uh, that were imposed earlier on? So, so like so many things, it's it's very, very mixed depending on, on where you are within the country as well as where you are socioeconomically within the country. Uh, stepping back just a little bit, even globally, there's some uh, social and behavioral research that suggests that, you know, that the kinds of things we need to do in a pandemic, the kinds of collective response that countries and cultures that have more of a collective identity to begin with are better positioned to adopt that and, and adopt sacrifices to help others and things like that. It's more socialized, whereas looser, more personal freedom-based cultures um, like the United States, uh, uh, to a certain extent, parts of Europe and elsewhere, uh, have a harder time with that. Uh, and it's it's um, uh, just, uh, um, and again, not to say one is better than the other, but in terms of responding to a pandemic, um, these sort of looser, sort of individual freedom-oriented uh, uh, cultures do tend to um, will have a harder time taking that collective approach and are having a harder time. So, um, but to answer your question more directly, I mean, certainly, I think for those who have salary jobs, those who are able to work from home, those who are able to, you know, uh, make the changes are, are doing better. And those that are hourly workers, essential workers uh, that are uh, very uh, frequently communities of color, communities in um, uh, lower socioeconomic statuses are, are, are not doing very well in terms of of uh, okay. the impact. And more generally, we're also seeing stressors on people, um, one, having to adjust, and in some cases that's settling in and folks are doing better, but also, you know, increases in domestic violence, increases in abuse, all of these things where you have a lot of social dynamics that are now extremely compressed. Um, and it can, there are uh, sociological factors, there are also individual and familiar factors in terms of who is actually able to manage this and who isn't. And these stresses, okay. the longer this goes on and the more uncertain it is, the more uh, challenging, it, ch challenging it's going to be for those in the middle of it. OK. And Dr Ali Amrani, I've just got time to ask you one quick question, a quick answer if you can, although it's a big question. What have we learned, have you learned from how other influenza pandemics uh, struck uh, the world? What have you learned from them that you can apply to this, that we can understand about this one? I think in, in brief, uh, the, the key lesson is to act early. And, and by early, as, I mean as soon as you the warning signs. Uh, and you need to get ahead of everything as quickly as you can and be prepared. Be prepared in terms of testing, medical uh, facilities, um, education of the public, uh, testing capabilities, uh, social distancing and so forth. Just being prepared and, and hit the ground running from the start as soon as you see the wave coming. Not wait until it hits your shore and then you're being reactive. All right. Gentlemen, we're out of time, but thank you very much. Hopefully there is light at the end of this uh, long tunnel. And so to Jeff Schlegel-Milch, to Dr Ali Amrani and to Jan Emmanuel-Denive, thank you all very much. And thank you, too, for watching.
You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story and I'm at Jazeera Bernard. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.